It is my great pleasure to be with you, and I, I'm so grateful for the invitation from my colleague An Angela, and from Christine, and from your search committee, and the choir, and my friend Vance, we go back a few years, Vance and I, and, and your, your wonderful band, and pianist, and the people have been very, very welcoming, and, and kind, and tolerant of the number of things I've thrown at them in the last 24 <laughs> hours. Uh, the choir's not used to having quite this much music happen that quickly, so we're, we have a very good time. Well, I say we are. We'll see. <laughs> then again, I leave soon, and they may say otherwise when it's over. Um, you're at a really interesting and exciting time in your congregation's history with uh, regard to the music program as you look to hire your first full-time music director, which at, at the size you are is just insane to me that you've made it this long without that kind of leadership. Um, so I, I'm just so excited for what the future holds for you uh, in terms of, of being able to articulate your faith through music with that kind of leadership. Um, we look to our large congregations like this one to, to be our leaders, to show us the way, to cut a, a new path for us, and, and we're excited to see where the future takes you and where you, in fact, take us. The German theologian Karl Barth once wrote that the community which does not sing is not the community. Now, what did he mean by that? I think that communities, uh, by and large, identify themselves by what they have in common. And communities that have song in common are bonded more deeply than just about any other kind of community there is. When we know one another's song, when we share that song in common, it binds us in a way that almost nothing else can. And if you're not a part of a community and you come in and you hear songs that aren't your songs, you can feel really alienated. Many of us, the first time we came into a UU church and they sang one of those songs that sounded like one of those songs we knew from somewhere else, but the words were all wrong. <laughs> oh, who are these people? Huh, I like those words better. I can actually sing them. Okay, well, let's see where this goes. It matters because the songs that we sing imprint themselves on us in terms of identity formation. They are who we are. I like to say we are what we sing. So when you are uh, a child, those songs will imprint on you in a way that carries you on well past childhood, long into adulthood. Those songs that, that identified who you were and the community you were a part of. Now, how many of you, uh, just by show of hands, were not raised Unitarian Universalist? Oh, good Lord, look at that. Okay. Um, so, how many of you uh, who were not raised UU went to vacation Bible school at some point along the way? Oh, look at all the vacation Bible schoolers. Sing me a song from vacation Bible school. <laughs> we got a couple going on. We got this little light over here. We've got Jesus loves me over here. Anybody else? Let's all sing Jesus Loves Me, right? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is. Uh, okay, that's enough of that. <laughs> You're not weak. You're beautiful and strong. But when's the last time you sang that song? Uh-huh. Some of you are getting a calculator out, right? Like, uh, let's see. Uh, but it was instant recall. How is it that song imprinted on you that some of you may not have sung it since Vacation Bible School 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago? <laughs> right? And yet it's still right there. And, and on some level, if the words don't really work for you, there was something about that that was sweet that reminded you of, of a tender time, hopefully a tender time in childhood, if that wasn't a, a painful experience for you, and maybe it was. Um, but that imprint lasts a long, long time. And so I ask you, what songs are we imprinting on our children that tell them what we are about as Unitarian Universalists? What is it that our children who are in this space today, or in this community, when they're 50, 60, 70 years old, and someone says, sing me a song from when you were a child, what are they going to sing? Now, it matters because 
if our children are going to be imprinted, they have to know that we actually enjoy singing, <laughs> that we find meaning in singing. In singing those songs that say who we are, we declare to the world, this is who we are. We have no creed as Unitarian Universalists. We have nothing else we agree on but our hymnal. <laughs> and even that, some of you are like, ah. <laughs> The old joke, you know the old joke, why are Unitarian Universalists such bad singers? Is because they're always looking ahead to make sure they agree with the words. <laughs> and yet I don't think we're bad singers. I think we're timid singers. I think singing has become something we don't do in the larger culture anymore, and so there's a vulnerability to it that makes us hesitant. The, uh, the great 20th century composer Charles Ives was also a church organist in New England, and one of he, his, the stories about him is that he, he told his congregation, You're, you have to sing as loud as you possibly can at all times. I don't care if you sing the right notes. It's not about that. It's about giving voice to your faith. And so he loved cacophony. If you ever listen to any of his music where he writes things in this key for that group and this key for that group and have them all play together. And that's what church sounded like for Charles. And so as we sing today, I'm going to invite you to sing really loudly. You're going to be very surprised at what happens when you make the effort to sing twice as loud as you usually do. So let's look at a song, number 12 in the Gray Hymnal. What I'd like to do today is look at some songs in our hymnal and see how they tell the story of who we are and who we have been, how we have evolved as a faith tradition over the centuries. O Life That Maketh All Things New, written by Samuel Longfellow, probably in 1875 or so. Um, he and one of his seminary classmates at Harvard, uh, Samuel Johnson, they were known as the Sams, and so Samuel Johnson, Samuel Longfellow. This Longfellow is the younger brother of Henry Wadsworth, the younger Longfellow, was a Unitarian minister. Um, and they had this project of writing and collecting hymns, and they published many hymnals in their time in the mid-19th century. And one of the things they were doing, they had this really interesting project. They said, we think that uh, the literal naming of the divines, words, songs about God, are falling out of fashion. Now, Unitarian Universalists have been saying this for a very long time. We keep trying to think this God thing is over, and well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not worked out so far for us. <laughs> but they were working on this project even in the mid-19th century. And so when you see songs like this, they say, what if we lift up metaphor that speaks of the divine without naming it specifically and so limiting us to this narrow vision of what it might be? So when you see a song like, like O oh, Life, notice the capital L that maketh, maketh all things new. You can tell it's old because it says maketh. Um, the capital L is a reference to the divine. So you look at those mid-19th century hymnals, there are all these weird words that are capitalized that shouldn't be capitalized, and they're, it's their insistence, the life is divine. Let's sing a verse of O life that maketh all, maketh all things new, really, really loudly. <laughs> seminary, one of my history, history projects was on hymnody, and I went and I read the prefaces of hymnals for, the, for 200 years, and the prefaces tell us the choices that the editors made about what they kept, what they got rid of, what they changed, and what was new, and those choices tell the story of who we are over time. You can tell all of you your history by reading the front three pages of every hymnal. It's a really cool project. So 1937, Hymns of the Spirit was one of the first major denominational efforts where the Unitarians and Universalists came together to produce a hymnal. And that took us to 1964, the Hymns for the Celebration of Life, which was the first hymnal produced after a consolidation when we became Unitarian Universalists, this new thing that we're still trying to figure out exactly what that is. And there are songs about that experience. If you look at number 145, as Tranquil Streams was a song that was written for and sung at the Consolidation in 1961. 
No, that can't be right, because he was dead in 1956. Huh. Maybe he, he saw it coming. Uh, <laughs> I got that wrong. Anyway, let's sing it anyway. Number 145, number verse 1. As tranquil streams that be They sang it at consolidation. They really did, I promise, because I've seen the order of service from the service in Boston. Anyway, trust me on that. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm leaving soon, so whatever. <laughs> Look at number 318. We would be one. This I know for a fact. I know this story. Uh, Samuel Anthony Wright wrote this song um, when the two youth groups, the Unitarian Universalist youth, merged 10 years before the denominations got their stuff together. The youth saw it coming. And they started doing the work. And this song was written when the youth groups merged in the 1950s. We would be one. Let's do the first verse. songs in our hymnals is full of the word we. We would be one. As one we pledge ourselves to greater service. So what do we mean by the word we? It's the most complicated, dangerous two-letter word in the English language. Because we make a lot of assumptions about what we mean by the word we. In 1964, that hymnal that came out, the Blue Hymnal, if you remember the Blue Hymnal, Hymns for the Celebration of Life, there were no songs, zero, written in a musical tradition other than the Western European hymnody tradition. Zero. Does that mean there, were no one, there was no one in our congregations who was other than white European? No. Did they see themselves in the we when we said we? I'm not sure. But it's a really important question. And as this, when this hymnal came out in 1992, 93, we took that question of we a little more seriously. There were over 30 songs out of the African American tradition in this hymnal. Did our we change? I don't think so. I think we started paying attention. And I think that, that word we causes us and, and it encourages us and de demands that we engage in very deep and meaningful and sometimes painful conversations about what we mean by the word we. Do we really see each other for who we are? See we one another clearly? Do we know who we are, as Harry Belafonte said? Are there songs we can't sing in the hymnal? There are certainly word issues, really interesting uh, word complicated issues. Like the word Lord, the, the people who put this hymnal together really did wonderful and sometimes failed experiments in inclusive language. Sometimes the poetry just doesn't work when you try to make it modern. And sometimes it does. And sometimes the agenda of uh, trying to root out patriarchy from those hymns and taking the word Lord out worked. Except we didn't take Lord out if it was in an African American song. Well, what does that mean? We're not going to sing precious life take my hand we're going to sing precious lord but we take lord out of the other songs and what does that mean those are great questions to wrestle with the question of a song like we'll build a land which i know a number of native american folks say but the land was already here and it was ours first 
a song like Standing on the Side of Love, near and dear to my heart, that I wrote. And I've had people in wheelchairs say, I can't sing that song with you unless I know that you know I'm here and that I understand what you mean by that metaphor. Songs that speak of brothers and sisters and normative gender identity in ways that leave so many people out, so many people who've become more visible to us in the last years. Once you see that, you can't not know it anymore. There are also larger context issues and really interesting ones. Look at number 189 in the hymnal, Light of Ages and of Nations. This is a very interesting and unique song in our hymnal because if you turn to one number 190, it's also Light of Ages and of Nations. It's the only song in the hymnal that appears twice with different tunes. Now, in the 19th century and, and before, you would never find a hymnal, or very rarely uh, would you find a hymnal that actually had music printed in it. It would just be a book of texts. And the organist would see that the tune, for example, this tune, if you look in the bottom right of the first page, it says, In Babylone 8787D. That is the metrical identification of the tune. So it tells you that the text has uh, eight lines, eight syllables, seven syllables, eight syllables, seven syllables, and there's a D, double it. So the organist would go through the, the hymn book, the tune book, find something that's an 8787 D, and play it. We'd all go, oh, we know that song, and we'd sing these words to whatever song they played. It was never a match. It wasn't locked in. So you had to know a lot of tunes, right? It was kind of cool. Um, it's a 20th century invention when we start to put text and music together that we get locked in, that this song goes with that tune always and forever. So we have this one. Light of ages and of nations, every race and every time. All right, that's the one, if you sing this, if you know this song, that's the tune we usually use. I don't know anybody who sings number 190, and I wonder why. Light of ages and of nations, every race and every time. Anybody know that? Yeah, it's Haydn, it's gorgeous, right? Except this group in Germany in the mid 20th century used it as their hymn. Deutschland, Deutschland, über alles. And a whole lot of people said, I'm never ever singing that tune again. Sorry, Mr. Haydn, but you lose, you know. But it's in here and it, and it provokes that question for us. And I think that's a good question to wrestle with. There are a lot, as I said, there are a number of um, African-American spirituals in our, our hymnal now. Let's look at number 116. What's interesting about the spirituals as they appear in our hymnal is that the vast majority of them come to us in their civil rights era adaptation. So these are not the way they used to be. They're the way the movement transformed them to be useful for the movement in the moment. So I'm on my way to the freedom land. Almost any time in a spiritual, in a, if you see it in our book, the word freedom probably used to be something else, right? I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom, used to be stayed on Jesus. I'm on my way to the freedom land, used to be I'm on my way to the Canaan land. And in the, in the time of slavery, the Canaan land was code for Canada. And if someone was singing, I'm on my way to the Canaan land, it meant I'm leaving tonight. And I asked my brother, come and go with me. And if he said no, I'll go anyhow. Completely changes the, the understanding of what's happening when we sing the song. I'm on my way and I won't turn back. For many of us, many of us who come out of lives of privilege, at least privilege in this nation, um, that notion of freedom is something that didn't come at a great cost. And so we sing it, and it's, oh, it's great, I'm on my way to the freedom land. And, and sometimes forget how much price has been paid by those who sung this song for generations before it came into our hymnal. Look at number 407. We are going to sit at the welcome table. Another song that was sung often in the civil rights movement, except they never sang we, was I'm going to sit at the welcome table. It was an affirmation of the individual. I am somebody, as Jesse Jackson has so often 
uh, known to say in his speeches. That comes straight out of the civil rights movement, an affirmation of the worth and dignity of the person that was denied by the system and the structure of evil, of racism. So when, when folks would sing this, I'm going to sit at the welcome table. I'm going to be a registered voter one of these days. Hallelujah. We've changed it to we. We're going to sit at the welcome table. A lot of us have been at the welcome table the whole time. <laughs> you know? So what does that mean? What does it mean for us to sing we in that moment? Good questions to wrestle with. Look at number 154. That this song is in here completely bewilders me. No more auction block for me. Because I'm thinking, who is going to pull that off? We don't have any, we have a few very richly diverse multicultural congregations in our movement, but they're very few, and none of them are not majority white. So what does it mean to sing or even have in our hymnal, no more auction block for me? When we were putting this turquoise book together, we had a meeting with the president of the, of the UUA at the time, Bill Sinkford, who was the first African-American president of the UUA. And this hymn came up in conversation, and he said, you know, I can't tell you the number of times I've been out on the road visiting as a guest minister in, in someone's congregation, and they say, uh, please let us welcome our UUA president by singing, no more auction block for me. <laughs> it's like, you have got to be kidding. You're lying. That can't be true. And he said, it happens over and over and over again. I I'm like, of all the things you can sing, they chose that. I, I can't believe it. And yet, I was talking with a, a, a colleague of mine who's a, a Jamaican-American uh, and UU minister, and she was lamenting about this song and, and going on a, a, a rant about it. And one of her white colleagues, who's a, a really well-known anti-racist activist, he said, you know, my ancestors were on that block too, and they were working, and I need to sing that song. It's a complicated thing that what we sing together. There's so much power. There's so much we can teach our children and we can learn from one another. And we could just engage with this tradition, with this music, and ask the hard questions about what does it mean to sing this together. Now, I'm from Nashville, so the issues around uh, race relations between white and African-American folks are, are very much a part of our legacy. When we talk civil rights, we're living in the middle of that story of this nation. But what are your context issues? Who's not here in the we in the Southwest? What do we mean by that here? I know we have a new Spanish language hymn hymnal, which is a, a wonderful um, new addition to our tradition. What does that mean? What does it mean for us to have that resource and, and have almost none of us use it? What we sing is who we are. Now, sometimes, I hate to tell you this, but you use are kind of weird. You know, I mean, we're, we're weird, some of us. I'm weird. And so it's probably good that there are some weird songs in our hymnal. Let's look at number 321, because this is a really weird one. Nobody sings this. This will be the only time you ever sing this. So this song was written by T.J. Anderson, who was a member of the Hymnal Commission for this 1992 book. Um, he was a, a noted, uh, really brilliant, avant-garde African-American composer um, and UU. And, uh, and they said, we really want you to write a song for the hymnal. And he said, you really don't. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to like what I do, you know, because he does not write beautiful, tuneful things. He writes really weird stuff. And, and they're like, no, no, we've we got to have something. So he finally relented and wrote this um, here in the flesh, which is just so strange. And just so you know, at the end of the piece, when you see all those notes, <laughs> he, he's quoting the Rite of Spring by Stravinsky at the end. Right? <laughs> Notice the hymn tune name is Song Spring. So it's this, ooh, all right, well, good luck. Let's see what happens here. <laughs> You don't have to sing quite as loud this time, you know. <laughs> but, but let's give it a shot, and, and go. Here in the flesh is all that we can know. All beauty, all wonder, all the power, all the unearthly colors, all Here in the self, we 
you know, I don't know. The more we do it, I'm thinking this might be the perfect UU song that there is. You know? <laughs> that says it. That's, that's it. That's who we are. And yet, you know, I get, I, I don't like, I don't use that song because I know what happens. As soon as he gets the, uh, 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 everybody starts to laugh. <laughs> and, and I don't want people laughing. I want them taking this seriously, that this is who we are. There's something beautiful in that text that I can't even tell you what it said because I'm trying so hard to figure out how to sing it, you know. Um, and we missed the whole point. Well, anyhow. What's great is that now, uh, starting in probably the mid-80s, maybe a little before, but with people like Carolyn McDade and Shelley Jackson Denham and Jim Scott, people who have a number of songs in here like Spirit of Life or Gather the Spirit, people started actually writing new melodies, new songs that are our songs. They're not borrowed from someone else's tradition. We don't have to do a dance or wrestle with, is it okay for us to sing this, or do we have to change the words? They're just writing songs that are who we are. And it's a beautiful, beautiful gift to have new songs that, that engage head and heart, new melodies that make sense of our faith. It makes us a faith worth singing about. Songs like, we are a gentle, angry people, Polly Neer's song that she wrote when Harvey Milk was assassinated in San Francisco. A song like Comfort Me, which Mimi Bornstein wrote when her father died. And a song like In My Quiet Sorrow, which Jeannie Gagné wrote when she was in the midst of depression, which almost didn't make it into the hymnal because we were like, it's too dark. And we said, but you know, dark is part of a life. And it needs to be part of worship, that sometimes that's where we are, and we need songs that hold us there, too. Or a song like Blue Boat Home that takes a beloved tune and, and turns it into something new. These songs are coming out of our hearts because there's something happening in our congregation, something happening among us that is beautiful and new and, and never before seen in terms of an inclusive theological community that welcomes all these different perspectives and finds meaning in engaging with one another. It gives us a breadth and a depth that is um, revolutionary. I'm going to close with one that uh, I, I particularly love. It's, it's listed as an African-American spiritual, and it's not. It was a song that Bernice Johnson Regan brought into the world in the mid-'80s, who was with the, the group Sweet Honey in the Rock. And it's called There Is More Love Somewhere. And some years ago in Nashville, um, we were preparing to resume the, the horrible practice of executing prisoners in the state of Tennessee after 40 years of uh, not doing so. And, you know, we were deeply engaged in the protests and the work to try to stop this from happening, from executing this man, Robert Glencoe, who was mentally ill. And there were a lot of questions about his conviction, a lot of questions about his mental status. And, and it became clear as we tried to fight it that we were not going to win, and that this man was going to be put to death in our name. And uh, an interfaith gathering of folks had been holding vigils and doing work and trying to stop this. And, and we said, we're all going to gather at the prison, in the yard of the prison that night. Um, people from every faith tradition in the, in the, in the city uh, Muslims and Jews and Buddhists and every variety of Christian that we have, and of course our congregation. And someone who was leading the group asked me, they, they knew I was a musician, they said, would you bring a song for us? Because what's going to happen is we're all going to gather and we're going to pray, and then when midnight comes and we know the process has begun, we're going to go silent. And when the word comes to us that he's dead, we want you to lead us in singing. Okay. So the night came and we gathered, and as I got there, people seemed to know I was the guy who was going to do the song. And all these people said, could you sing this, or could you sing that, or could we sing Amazing Grace, or could we sing naming specific songs that were going to work for them, but would leave everybody else out. And I understood where that was coming from. I said, I, I think I have a song. It's okay, I think I have a song. And so midnight came and we went silent and eventually the word did get back to us that Robert Glencoe was dead and he looked to me and I started to sing. There is more love somewhere 
There is more love somewhere, and I'm gonna keep on till I find it. There is more love somewhere. Will you sing that with me? There is more love somewhere. There is more love somewhere. And I'm going to keep. simple song about love, love so great, so much greater than we can ever know or hold, holding us. And everyone there heard themselves in that song, because everyone there understood that they are held by love. And we didn't need to get specific and leave other people out. I think that's a great gift that our music, the music coming from our hearts today, gives us. It's a faith worth singing about. It's a faith worth imprinting on our children. When my children are old and someone says, sing me a song from when you were a child, I want them to say, there is more love somewhere. And know that that is what, who we were and who we are. Blessed be and amen. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit. We're going to sing one more song. It's the purple sheet in your order of service. Life calls us on. church for all that is our lives, joy and sorrow, memory, presence and dreaming, the lowly and the sublime. If you have come looking for a place to nurture your soul, to heal, to grow, to become who you are meant to be, may you find it here and may you go out lifted up. The calling to spiritual community is an ancient one and the vocation of seeker, a holy office. So go in peace, friends, and may love bless you and keep you until we gather again. Oh. Uh -huh.
Go in peace, friends.